Deirdre Pretorius, and I would like to welcome you and thank OASIS for making this webinar possible. I would also like to remind you that this session is recorded with all the hiccups, whatever it may provide. So the objective of this webinar is to assist you to make quality submissions to the African Journal of Primary Healthcare and Family Medicine. The plan is to develop, oh gosh, now it doesn't want to move. Sorry guys, talking about hiccups. There you are. The, uh, the, the, the plan is to develop the sexual health section of this journal into an independent journal focusing on sexual health interests in the African continent. The African Journal of Primary Health Care and Family Medicine was launched in 2008 and is also the official journal of Wonka and the Prima Family Network. It is endorsed by SASHA, the Southern African Sexual Health Association and Pain South Africa. And as it goes with all quality journals, is this journal indexed as an open access journal. So now we, we, it's time for our speakers. But before I introduce them, I would like to ask you to, to write your, your, your um, questions in the chat box. Um, we will answer it at the end of the presentations. And if it happens that we don't have enough time, then we will actually respond to those questions via email. So our two guests this, after, or this morning or afternoon is Prof. Ian Cooper and, and Dr. Mutlatsu Mulambo. Prof. Ian is the director of the Ukwanda Center for Rural Health and the um, acting head of the Department of Global Health at the, at the University of Stellenbosch. Dr. Mutlambo currently serves as the director um, of institutional research in the Department of Institutional Intelligence at the University of South Africa. Prof. Ian said that he actually stopped counting his articles at 100 and Dr. Mutlatsu is on her way with over 40. So we are looking forward to learning from both these experienced writers. Prof. Cooper, you can take over. Thanks Deirdre and uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I just need to share my uh, slides. Um, just give me a moment for that. Um, sorry for that. I think we are ready to do that. There we go. Um, can you see that, Deirdre? Yes, sir. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, uh, my role is really to to set the scene for the uh, the webinar this this afternoon. And the first question we have to ask is why publish. We've taken it as, as, as a given that we, we want to publish or need to publish, but each of us has our own reasons for wanting to publish. And maybe you want to think about what yours is for a moment and, and why you'd want to publish. If you're in academic space, obviously there's pressure, publish or perish, uh, but there are many motivations. I would like to argue that if we do research, it is unethical not to publish. We have collected data from people and or whatever process we have used to actually not do something with the data and share that information with others, um, I think is unethical. So we, we do have uh, a push from an ethical point of view towards doing that, whatever other motivations we might have. Whatever that motivation, you always need to think about your article as needing to tell a story. So as this a diagram shows that a decent research paper will report a study, but a great research paper tells a story. And we need to be thinking as we go into writing an article, what is the story I want to tell? What have I found that I want people to know? And how can I actually make it interesting for them? It's not simply just putting our data out there and, and leaving it to them to interpret. To ensure that your manuscript is readable, there's some key things that you need to be thinking about. The first issue is the structure, the IMRD format, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but we need a structure. We also need to think about the flow of the story. Any story you read has a very clear and logical flow to it. 
we can't go with a story that starts somewhere and then jumps somewhere else and then goes to the end and then comes back uh certainly if i'm reading a book like that i'll just throw it away it's a you know it, it doesn't take me anywhere some might move in time backwards and forwards but it's done very purposely in order to assist the flow of the story so we need as we plan what we're writing to think about that flow it is also very important that we balance being brief with giving sufficient information and it's easy to make an error in either direction we write too much, that is common. So many articles I review as an editor are just too long. But other times people write insufficient information that, that we can't actually get what we need from it or the conclusions don't make sense because we don't have the background to it. We need to minimize repetition. Again, unfortunately, many articles, uh, what they say in the introduction, they repeat in the discussion or they repeat the results again and again and repeat the results again in the discussion. And we need to make sure that we are minimizing that. There isn't space in an article for that. And our article is more likely to be read if it is shorter. We need to make sure we follow journal guidelines. Every journal, including PHCFM, has its own format and style, etc. So go to the journal guidelines, make sure you familiarize your, yourself with them and make sure that what you write fits into that. And it's always advisable when you write an article to really be thinking about the journal so that you're writing for the readership, writing for the audience as you are writing. Acceptable language use. If you're publishing in English, as is the case for, for mostly for, for PHCFM and, and, and many other journals, you need to make sure that your language is acceptable. Don't use colloquialisms, but also make sure that if you are, are not comfortable in English, that you get some somebody is to help you with that and critically if you are a student a master's or phd student or whatever it might be don't try and re reduce your research report into an article write it as something new think about what is the key message i want to convey and, and write it separately so the imrd we are working through uh, in this webinar the introduction, methods, results, and discussion. I will talk to introduction. Motlatsu will talk to methods and results, and I will talk again to discussion. Um, but remember that that is the standard. Each journal might have variations within that, but all of them have that as the basis for, for any format that they use. So the introduction. Why do we have an introduction? It's because we need to set a background for the reader, but we also need to draw the reader in as to why they might want to read it. And I encourage you to look at the article by Lorelai Lingard on joining the conversation, the problem gap book heuristic. I found that very useful in terms of what we want to do. We want to sketch what is the problem? What is the gap we're going to address and try and put a hook in? What, is, what makes this article interesting to the reader? What makes our findings interesting? Uh, so entice the reader really into introduction with what the key thing is that you're going to come back to in your results and discussion. So there are three questions that you answer in the introduction. The issue you are going to explore in that problem. What is the gap in the knowledge and the, the both literature, gap in knowledge, both literature and experience. Uh, our conceptual framework, we use that term in social sciences, comes from both the literature and experience. And then why does the issue matter, that hook that I have uh, referred to. Join a conversation. See what other people in that journal have been saying and make sure that you are connecting to that conversation. You don't come in uh, completely from outside. It's not an out of space experience. It's a very grounded experience when you're writing um, an article. Part of the introduction is a literature review. There's not space in an article for a full separate literature review. So you need to be focused. Make sure you use recent sources. You know, if the most recent source is five years old, immediately it raises questions when one is reviewing an article. Obviously, there might be seminal articles that we refer back to. I mean, sometimes you refer back to, you know, nobody's written something as good as what somebody wrote in 1976 about a particular issue, for example. But those are, are, are few and far between. Organize your literature logically, so it has a flow, again, that logical flow. What we want to do in it is to say, this is what is known, this is the gap, 
that we aim to address and this is what my study can contribute to the literature or what I hope it can contribute. At the end of the introduction, we must, should state our aim and, and, and we might have objectives within that aim, uh, but usually the aim is enough. It's stated explicitly. It may include the purpose, which is what we hope the impact of reaching the aim might be. And it immediately leads into the research method, methods because we chose our research methods originally on the basis of our aim. And that leads me to hand over to Matlatso. Thank you, Professor Cooper. I'm now going to share my screen. Yet, are you able to see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And Hoya Mera Dumelang, Saubona, Tobela Molweni, Dimasia Ri, Bonjo, Jambo. Salamand, greetings to you all in your respective languages. Uh, and let me take this opportunity to thank our host, uh, the sexual health editor, Dr. Pretorius, and the IOSIS team for the opportunity to be part of this exciting scholarly webinar where we reflect on matters of uh, getting published. I am always intrigued by the words of uh, the late uh, famous poet, Maya Angelo, who said, um, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So in the case of uh, original research, we strive to tell those uh, stories, those untold stories using the various methodologies. So Professor Cooper has just given us uh, great insights on uh, writing the first part uh, of the article which is all about uh, contextualizing the study in a manner that uh, will hook the reviewers and the editors who meticulously go through your submission. So the next section that follows after the introduction and background and objectives and aim and objectives is the method section. So I will be uh, giving you a few tips on uh, writing uh, winning research methods uh, and uh, as you can see from this slide, the methods section is at the center. So it means that it is central to the anatomy of the research paper. And uh, it is therefore the backbone of what goes into the research paper. So as you are writing your methods section, it is important to make sure that uh, your methods section is intentionally visible uh, so that uh, it provides uh, details about uh, how you have uh, uh, conducted your study. Without this part, this centerpiece, you will not have a good research paper or you will not have a, a research paper at all. Now, the purpose of the methods section is uh, simply to respond to the four W's and an H. I'm going to start with the H part of it so looking at the how part how so with the how uh here the idea is try is to try and uh, indicate uh, in your research article the plan that you followed in answering the the research question how did you go about uh, answering the research question and the what part uh looks at uh, the various ways that uh, you, you've tried to use in trying to understand the research problem that you are investigating. And the why part of the study looks at uh, the rationale as to why, as, as to why did you choose the, uh, you know, a particular uh, research method and then, or an inquiry approach in trying to respond to the research problem that uh, you are trying to address. And again, the methods section looks at, at uh, where, in terms of the setting where you have conducted the study, it needs to be explicitly set in your article. And again, it, does, it addresses the issue of when, in terms of uh, the timeline. All these aspects are crucial. In, it, it, they are crucial in the sense that they allow for replication of uh, you know, your study going forward. So the details that you provide 
you try and make sure that uh, if somebody has to conduct the same study in the same setting, they are able to replicate it step by step. That's how your method section has to look like. There are key considerations for writing a method section. Um, and uh, you will realize that uh, many journals do not like to have uh, irrelevant details in the methods section. In other words, you don't have to write long, long, long methods sections as, uh, as uh, Professor Cooper has already indicated. But while you're trying to write the methods section succinctly, please remember that a detailed methods ensures rigorous, transparent and open science. Obviously, the detail that you have to provide, it has to be critical detailed. In that way, you are showing that uh, you, are, you are showing you are being transparent about how your study was conducted. And you are also ensuring that uh, other people who want to conduct similar study can follow your approach. Remember that the method section is about showing the roadmap that you followed. In, in, in conducting your research journey. So you want to be as explicit as possible. And another way of presenting your methods section, you could use your flow charts and decision trees whereby you try and show the process that you followed in, in, in conducting your study. Remember that the methods section has to be as descriptive as possible. So it, it is a descriptive process where you are trying to outline all the processes that you followed in conducting your study. And at the end of the day, the validity or the trustworthiness of, of your study is highly dependent uh, on, your, on your methods section. I will now be unbundling the methods section. And uh, please note that uh, the structure of the methods section varies. It always varies depending on the field of research or even the journal, but uh, some of the subsections that I'm going to be talking about, they are, they are almost standard for, 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 for the journals. So it's important that uh, you capture the correct headings within the methods section according to, to the journal that you are writing for. So first of all, I'll look at the research design. This is where you need to clearly clarify the methodological underpinnings of the study. As I'm reading your, your, your submission, one should be able to understand, you know, the methodological underpinnings in, as to whether this study is a qualitative or quantitative study. Again, from reading the methodological underpinnings, it becomes very important for one to be able to see what philosophical worldviews or paradigms are informing the study. And, uh, of importance to note is that the choice of the design is, la is largely informed by the nature of the research problem and also in the case of qualitative research the researchers own experiences and the study audience that the, the, the article is targeting it's actually uh, also you know informs the design of the study it's important to make sure that your research de design aligns with the research aim, objectives, and the research questions. The next section that I'll look at is the research setting. So in order to assist uh, the, the reader to sort of uh, get a holistic picture about the context or the environment where your study was conducted, it's important that uh, you mention the environmental aspects about the study setting. Here, what I mean is that you will need to indicate where was your study you know, conducted? Was it in a home setting, clinic setting, hospital, school setting? You need to provide that kind of detail. And you can even go slightly further to try and give that context and just indicate what are the issues that are happening in that particular environment. For instance, you can highlight briefly just social issues uh, that are affecting the environment and also issues like uh, the available or non-availability of resources. That kind of detail becomes very, very useful when you are writing the results. Uh, I mean, the, when you are discussing your results and you are trying to interpret the results, it gives a good context. You will see that there's a certain behavior that uh, you are seeing from the findings then the setting might uh, sort of uh, assist in coming with the clear conclusions. And then the next section is the sampling. 
This is where you need to clearly articulate the type of probability or non-probability sampling that was followed in conducting your study. We do know that uh, there are various types here. You need to be as explicit as possible. And uh, from the sampling method, one should be able to match the research question. The two should not be disjointed at all. And you would like it becomes very important for you to also highlight, uh, you know, the study population and the reasons for choosing that particular study population, and also touch on the issues of uh, sampling sampling size as as to how you calculated it. How did you determine that? Uh, with regards to qualitative, obviously, you need to touch on issues of saturation, which is a highly topical uh, issue at this stage. And you also need to just. Uh, discuss uh, whether you have you had uh, any sampling bias uh, and also the power analysis you, you need to explain it clearly in terms of how you have calculated uh, your your sampling the next section is the data collection so this is where you need to be precise and clear provide a clear description in terms of the process that you followed in terms of uh, what the, in terms of the type of data that you have collected and uh, the target populate, uh, population for your study and the reasons why you've chosen that uh, population. And you need to indicate the kind of approach that you have actually used in uh, collecting data and provide the reasons that uh, led to that decision. And uh, it becomes crucial as well for you to be uh, to explain the steps that you followed in trying accessing the participants for your study and also indicate who actually collected uh, the data. Issues of consent to participate, refusals and reasons also, they are very critical, especially when it comes to qualitative. You want to mention the reasons as to why did other participants uh, refuse. In case you are doing uh, you know, quantitative, or you do, you're doing a, an experimental study, you would need to mention you know, the kind of intervention that uh, your study entailed how were the groups compared, etc. And again, mention issues of uh, the period of data collection. How long did it take to collect data? What sort of challenges did you encounter as you were trying to collect uh, data? And uh, with regards to the qualitative, you should also highlight issues of whether you went back for repeat interviews or you, you returned the transcripts for validation by the participants. And as part of the data collection se uh, you know, section, it's important that also you highlight issues of uh, instruments, you know, the instruments or tools that you have used to collect data. You need to clearly stipulate uh, how were the data collection tools or instruments developed. Did you use an already available tool uh, did you, or did you modify it? Or did you develop a tool from scratch? If you did, what informed such development? So you need to be as explicit as possible. Remember, we're talking about uh, replication, so you don't want to, to, to leave important detail. And it's important as well for you to give a brief, uh, just a brief detail around uh, the content, what is covered you know, in the tool, and uh, mention issues around the validity and reliability of the tool. How was it measured? Uh, and I'm looking at uh, the content validity there. Did you even pilot your study? When did you do it? So you need to mention that those kind of things. And then the most critical part of uh, the method section as well, it is the data analysis, where you need to describe, you know, the processes or the techniques that you followed in preparing data for analysis. And you can even indicate some softwares that you use to analyze your data indicate issues of uh, you know statistical tests that you performed did you do descriptive uh, st you know analysis or inferential analysis so you need to provide that kind of detail in the case of qualitative you need to indicate uh, the analysis approach there are many approaches that that uh, one can follow you need to indicate and the reasons why you chose that approach of importance you need to also show the alignment of the analysis method with the research questions there should not be uh, you know some some gap whereby one is uh, is left uh, having questions around uh, a, you know a particular analysis method in the case of quantitative you need to look at how measures were uh, how measures were scored and converted into variables you also you need to look at the codes and the themes uh, identification in the case of uh, 
you know, qualitative, whether you used inductive or deductive uh, approach. And again, in the case of qualitative, uh, you need to indicate uh, the issue of our data coders. Did you have one? If you had more than one, how did you address issues of uh, intercoder reliability? And lastly, ethical considerations are critical. How did you adhere to the ethical, you know, you know, consideration throughout the study? That is uh, before you even, you know, started uh, with your study. How did you make sure that you adhere to the ethical aspects? And before you collect uh, data, obviously you need to mention, like, like in your in your in your paper, you need to mention issues like uh, how access was uh, obtained which ethics committee approved your study, which uh, you know, local site keepers provide, uh, did provide the permission for you to conduct the, the study. You need to mention that uh, kind of detail. And uh, during the collection of, the, of, of, of data, what kind of, uh, you know, how did you address issues of uh, you know, informed consent, confidentiality issues, the privacy, and while you're doing the analysis and writing up of the report, how did you also ensure the anonymity and the privacy of the participants? How did you show that you respect, uh, you know, the participants' information? Those things are critical as you are writing the, the, this section of uh, the paper. So in the end, your method section is the glue that binds all the sections of the paper together. So you, you need to be explicit about how you did your study, what steps you followed, why you followed those steps, and uh, where you did your study, and when you did it. The reviewers will be smiling all the way while they are reviewing your article if you do that. Thank you. I'm going to now give hand over back to Professor Cooper for the next section. Thank you, Dr. Mlambo. Um, I, I was thinking when you were talking about Maya Angelou and that, that quote, I've just read a novel called The Library of the Unwritten, which is about writ unwritten stories which land up in hell. Which it, very, it was very interesting. No, the whole concept, we all have unwritten stories and if we don't finish them, what happens to them? Uh, but anyway, I must move on to my next uh, section. Thank you very much for uh, for that, that input. Um, and yeah, so I, it's my job to, to wrap up then with the results and discussion. And really when we're talking about the results and discussion, we're talking about the what, what did you find? That's the results and the so what. It's explain to the read, reader what you think the meaning of your results are. Um, you've had time, you have all the detail, you can't present all of that. So you need to do that explanation to uh, for the reader. When you are presenting your results, choose what to report. You don't show all your results. That's not because you're hiding things. It's just there isn't space. You've got so much to, to, to results that you will have obtained. Um, and sometimes you can't put all of your research in one article. You might need to do more than one article. But even if you write in one article in your research, you need to choose, how does it link to your story? What illustrates your story best uh, in terms of without hiding things and, and certainly be, it's important to pre pre present negative results as well as positive uh, results, particularly if you're doing quantitative work. So don't dump all your results into this section and leave the reader to try and battle their way through it. Choose what you're gonna show and choose what you will highlight. So again, you might present a whole lot of results in tables, but think, what do I want to highlight? What do I want to point out to the reader so that they will make sense of it? It's important here that when you use tables, that you balance what's in the tables with the text. Don't repeat everything in text that is in the table. Your text is to point out the key findings or what is significant or, or how the tables relate to each other. It's not about simply repeating what is in, in the table or diagram or figure, whatever you might have. So it's important to avoid duplication when you're doing that. Too often, there are too many tables in articles that are submitted. Many journals actually limit the number of tables. 
Too often the tables are too detailed, so it's difficult to make sense of them. And too often uh, the text duplicates what is in, in the tables. So pay attention to that. And then the discussion, the so what. What is the purpose then of the discussion? The key thing that you're doing in the discussion is saying, have you answered the question, so what? Have you answered the, the question you set out to answer when you embarked on this research? It's not a matter of simply taking each result and saying something about each result uh, in your discussion. That is a very boring discussion uh, and, and uh, we need to find ways to move beyond that. So bring the results together and explain how they have answered your original research question. Link into the literature, link, link into your experience, link in back to the introduction. You need to show if you have addressed the gap. Remember the problem gap hook? So you've answered the research question or you haven't, you've addressed the problem. Address the gap. You've said you are trying to meet this gap in the literature. You've got to refer back to that and show how you have contributed to the knowledge um, that is there, that you've added to what people know already. And then you also need to talk about what were the limitations in addressing this. Reflect on, on where your research couldn't go or where the limits are such that you can't make broader statements or generalizations or whatever it might be. Um, so that's a key part of your discussion. Another key part of your discussion is the conclusion. Uh, some journals have it as part of the discussion some have it as a separate section it doesn't matter what are you going to put in your conclusion and it's really what you're putting is the key lesson from the story why did you want to tell the story in the first place so what has come out the conclusion that you're making from that and linked to that is what is the message you want everyone to take away from your article uh, many people unfortunately will jump to the conclusion when they read your article. So you must be very clear of what the message is that you're trying to get. And if you have a good message, people sometimes then go back and read it to find out how did they get to that point uh, and that that message in uh, the article. So from that, I want to jump to something more general, but equally critical uh, in terms of, of writing your article. So you've, you've presented the story and everything I get. But if you have more than one of you writing the article together, it is important that you satisfy the International Committee of Medical Journal Editor, Editors rules for authorship. And there are four criteria that must be met. So you must make sure that everybody's on. And this is a problem because we know, unfortunately, in some academic institutions, the head of department wants to be on every article. Well, they don't very often meet these criteria and it must be used uh, strictly and the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors said that unless these are met, art people should not be credited as authors. They can be acknowledged in the acknowledgements, but they shouldn't be authors. So the first is that the author must make substantial contributions to the conception or the design of the work or, because sometimes people come in after the protocol, the acquisition, analysis, or interpretation of data for the work. So it can be around interpretation, but if there's substantial contribution uh, there, uh, it, it, it satisfied the criteria. Secondly, authors must be involved in drafting the work or revising it critically for important intellectual content. Often when we work as a team, one or two authors will be responsible for drafting and others are involved in, in revising it. But there must be uh, a critical engagement at that point. Thirdly, you have to give final approval when the version uh, of the version that is published. Um, so it can't be submitted without the final approval of everyone who is an author. And lastly, and this has been added more recently by the committee, that every author must be in agreement to be accountable for all aspects of the work in relation to its accuracy and integrity. So everybody is jointly accountable. You cannot say if there's a challenge, oh, no, no, well, you know, it, it was my, my students' work, you know, I, I, well, uh, sorry, you are accountable if your name is on there. So these are important uh, criteria to remember.
Some broad tips for writing. Learn by reviewing. Every journal, including primary healthcare and family medicine, needs reviewers. We need good reviewers, obviously, but you learn by doing. Uh, and certainly when one chooses reviewers, one cho tries to choose some experienced reviewers and some less experienced reviewers. It's a learning process, but get involved. That's how you will improve your own writing. Partner with experienced authors. I talked about writing together as teams. Uh, try to be bring in experienced people into your team that can support you uh, and help you in the process of learning. If you're not completely comfortable, get language assistance. Uh, in the Center for Health Professions Education, where um, I do a significant amount of teaching, it is a requirement of all MPhil students that they have to submit their work to an editor before they can actually submit the final research report because this is so uh, important. It can make such a difference. And ultimately, make sure the, that the manuscript is readable, that, that it's accessible, that people can, uh, can enjoy it. We don't want it to be written in medical um, handwriting uh, and, you know, tailor it to, to the audience using a lot of very technical medical terms when you are in a more uh, educational journal, for example, might not be appropriate. By the same terms, very um, high level social science terminology in a medical journal may be inappropriate. And the last thing I want to say is that don't give up if you're rejected. Try another journal. You know, uh, whatever wherever you're submitting, there are papers and many examples of this are, are papers that have been rejected initially and have been published in another journal and have received very good responses uh, from from readers around that. Uh, so whatever you do, don't give up. And with that, uh, I will hand back over to Dr. Pretorius. Deirdre. Ian, thank you. Thank you. I, every time I listen to you guys, I just hear a lot of new things and I learn a lot of new things so um, I've really enjoyed listening to you again. So before I explain the summary process, uh, the uh, submission process, I just quickly want to summarize. Prof Cooper, you actually told us about the problem, the gap and the hook. That thing that must make it interesting for the reader to read the article and it must always end, your, your introduction must end with a, the clear aim of the study. And then Dr. Mutlatsu reminded us about the method and results sections that are the spine of the study, very important in terms of repeatability. And that those, especially the method section, must be very clear. And remember your author guidelines. Um, perhaps a small tip that I've used, because I'm also not a natural writer, is to copy, cut and paste the author guidelines into my document and then start developing my article around that to make sure that, that I have all the components there. And initially it helps you a lot. Then the results must be concise and specific in either a table format or the text. And then very important, as Prof. Cooper said, choose what you want to highlight. The discussion session must address the gap in your research and then that so what question. And I can just share with the audience, I can't tell you how many times I heard that from both Dr. Mutlatsu and Prof. Cooper. So what? Very important. Okay, so now your, your article is ready for um, submission and you choose the journal to join the conversation. So, for instance, if you want to submit to the section, uh, sexual health section of the journal, you must address the sexual health topic, whether it's sexual rights or sexuality in general, sexual functioning or sexual well-being. Now, if you look at this um, slide in terms of the submission process, you will see it starts off with you being ready to submit. You must make sure that your format complies with that of the, the author guidelines of the journal. And then very important, as Prof. Um, Cooper um, referred to, the, the, the issue of a language editor or a proofreader. Very few of us re actually write in our first language. That's very important. You submit then online. So make sure that your authorship and license agreement forms are there, that your ethical clearance letter conflict of interest statement to cover letter, there is a checklist that you can use that will help you to facilitate to make sure that you have all the documents in place. It then goes to a technical reviewer. Now, this is the gatekeeper of the journal. 
The technical reviewer will then check whether the topic is relevant for that specific uh, article. If in doubt, they will refer to the editor and ask. And then they will see whether you've complied with the requirements, the format, the documents, etc. When they are happy with it, they then actually refer it or, or allocate it to a section editor. When the section editor um, gets this document, we invite reviewers. Now, you may think it's easy to invite reviewers. You click a button and you invite them. Sometimes they don't respond for weeks. So you re-invite them and you remind them and you phone them. So that's where the, the process of patience starts for an for a author. After your submission, there's a lot of things that's going to happen. And one of the delays is actually getting the reviewers. Now, these reviewers are selected based on their interest in either your topic or your research methods. So when the reviewer agree or agrees, then the reviewer will, um, we will send the, the document to the reviewer and give them time to actually go through your document and give feedback. They give feedback to the section editor, but very important, they also make a recommendation and they can say accept as is, which seldom happens, or accept with minor revisions, which is most likely going to happen, or resubmit for a review. So they feel there's a lot, the, the article has potential, but there's a lot of things that needs to change or move or whatever. That's better description or less. So upon the resubmission of these corrections that the authors did, this will go then again to the one of the, the previous reviewers. So we don't send it to a new review, reviewer that will add new, inf, new questions, etc. It goes back to one of the previous reviewers. And they can then say, okay, yay or nay, we accept it or we decline it. Or it can be basically declined from the very beginning that the reviewers feel is not good. But usually we try and find the potential in the article and if it's well written, we can work with it. After that, it's sent for production. An invoice is generated and then you must pay that before publication. That's the, the more difficult part for the writers. The production team will then set your article in a way that, that it looks when it's published. It's actually nice to see it the first time, how it really looks when it's ready for publication. You may be asked to do final corrections or clarify some aspects. Sometimes they will ask you this table, is it yours or did you copy it somewhere? Or this abbreviation, are we right if we assume this is what you say? So they may ask you for some clarity. If everything is in place, then it's released for publication. So yeah, we are looking forward to receiving more publications from you. And before we say goodbye, any questions? Um, I've seen people requesting the, um, the slides. I don't know whether my colleagues have a, 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 a problem with that. We'll, we'll come back to you. Rikani, I see your hand is up. You're welcome to talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to say, um, I enjoyed the session. It was very, it was reviving for me as I once published with the same journal. However, I'm concerned about the turnaround. Like, you know, I don't know how you guys would work around that. So my, my, my manuscript was accepted and it took another four months to be published. So why, how do you work around that? Because I saw on the whole uh, journey of same publication, submission and everything, but I, I don't see where the duration is specific. Is it because of you have a lot or what could be the reason? Because that's another thing that discourages people to always come submit. When we think of uh, the journal, we'll be like, ah, those ones, they will take four months after accepting. I think that's the whole lot of frustrating. So I, this is just an advice to say, let's look around that. And yeah, so that we, uh, we can be also excited and also to commend our students and our colleagues to come publish. Thank you for that feedback. And, and what you are saying there is very important. And Prof Cooper, I would like you also to respond to that. Um, just from my side, because it is in this journal, um, it, the, the, the first, the technical review is about seven days. And that's usually quite easy. The problem start inviting reviewers. Um, you will find that some of our colleagues read their emails once a month. 
um, sometimes you have a specific um, topic and you don't have reviewers for that. So you will you would have noticed that in January we actually sent out a request for reviewers, especially for the sexual health section. So we need some expertise and, and sometimes it takes time to get it. Then in terms of the review, life happens. So sometimes you get one reviewer within a week or two, but the other, other reviewer has a hiccup and it takes longer. So unfortunately, um, it is it is a long or a lengthy process. Um, I can just say to you that our weekly statistics in terms of our turnaround times is definitely competitive with a lot of other good journals. Prof. Ian, you are also in this business, so perhaps your comments? Yeah, I mean, for me, the biggest challenge, uh, I work as an editor for two journals. Uh, the biggest challenge is in finding reviewers. Usually if reviewers agree, I mean, yes, you have to chase them up and so on. But I mean, sometimes I can tell you for a BMC Medical Education and Rural Remote Health, I can invite 20, 25, 30 people without getting responses. Uh, at some point you need to say, is it because of the topic? Is this topic not appropriate and therefore nobody's interested in reviewing it? Uh, and you've got to go back and look at it again. But yeah, it's just, I mean, the volume of articles that have been coming out since COVID has just been phenomenal. And that has certainly been a part to it. Unfortunately, there are many people who publish a lot who don't review. And the way that, I mean, I do a lot of reviewing for other journals as well, because I believe that it is our responsibility as people who publish, as academics, to be involved in reviewing. And for every article you publish, you should be reviewing two, uh, at least. Uh, two articles for, for other authors because you had the privilege of having your article reviewed in order to get it published. If in your question you're talking about what happens once an article is actually been through review and accepted to publication, I can't respond to that. The journal will have to respond, but that should be short. Once you've actually finally been accepted, it should be a couple of weeks uh, and no more than that. Prof. Cooper, you're very right. It is a couple of weeks. The, the big challenges the review. So um, all I can ask, have you registered as being a reviewer, please? That will help us tremendously. Any other questions? Well, it seems to me that the two of you have done such a good job. There's no questions. Ah, there's one, Sunanda. You're welcome to talk. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute. Uh, I just wanted to respond about the length of time after the acceptance. Um, to some extent, I think um, if, if an author gets their paper accepted, then in, in a sense, they should take a deep breath and feel glad about it. But there's a whole production process after the acceptance. Um, and it also depends on the time of year, because I think if the papers start going through the proofreading and the, the galleys and all of that, just before um, you know the close down of the universities, then it could be an extra month just over Christmas. So um, those are all the reasons. It, it, I think it usually takes more than two weeks. Um, and then sometimes also the journal will, uh, will collect articles so that sometimes you have the same theme or you know uh, if, if particularly if it's in the sexual health collection, it may be that it's going to be paired with something else. Those are the reasons. But I think once you've got your paper accepted, it's going to be there at some point. It's just I know people are excited to see it in print. Uh, the big problem is the gap between, um, uh, you know, trying to get a review, but also if the paper is borderline and it's been um, the decision was resubmit for review and you have to send it back to the same reviewer then there's a very That's long gap. And sometimes as an editor, I actually make the decision myself. I go through it and give feedback on what needs to be done. And sometimes you have to send it back. I've had papers I've sent back three or four times to try and get it to a standard that is acceptable for the paper. And I think authors don't understand that, that we're in a way the gatekeepers for quality. So we want the papers to be of a high enough quality for the paper, for the journal. Thanks. Thank you, Sunanda. I think that's a very, very valuable contribution. Um, I can just say that from my from my own side, I have also 
recent papers and even arranged for after hours sort of tutoring to try and see how you know how can I help you because you can see it's a good this good research but the writing is 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 a, is a problem um or the way they they compile it and and unfortunately not all of us are natural writers like Prof Cooper and Mutatsu <laughs> for some of us it comes with really really a lot of headaches so um thank you for that um I I I really appreciate that contribution so Prof Cooper I don't know anything that you want to say as as a conclusion yeah, I'm not sure I buy into the natural writing. It, it, it takes practice. I mean, that's that's, that's the thing, you know. Like anything else, you you've you've got to uh, practice at it. And you know, the 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 more you practice, the the better you get. But I, I come back to you know writing with other things. I mean, with other people. And when I moved to Stellenbosch, I mean, I'd published a lot but not as much in health professions education and to write with some social scientists who who were very experienced in, in health professions education actually really improved my writing and, and enabled me to take my writing up to, to another level. Um, so we can always learn and grow and, and improve. So you, what you are telling us, stay humble and learn. <laughs> Dr. Mutlatsu, some closing words from you? Thanks, thanks, Chair. From my end, I think uh, everything that uh, Professor Cooper said, I aligned very well with it. And just to say that, uh, you know, creating a habit, just a habit of uh, writing, you know, and blocking the time to actually make sure that uh, you do write, even when the time does not necessarily allow, it will really take you to the next level because you will never actually have time that you say, you know, I've got ample time to write. So make that time and make it a habit and then writing will come naturally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mutlatsu. So um, again, for the two of you, I really appreciate the time that you've dedicated to this and our audience, I, we hope you've benefited. And if there's something like this in the future that we see you again, thank you very much. And thanks for the team at ISIS who made this possible. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.